Welcome back to Insight, the podcast that looks beyond data and AI into the real world. I'm Dr. Amit Patel, and in this episode, we explore how algorithms connect us emotionally, in particular through music and romance. If music is based on maths, is maths affecting our emotions? And how well can a dating app really know us from the data we give it? Or be able to match us successfully if, for example, you choose not to disclose your sight loss? With me and Kika today, I have mathematician, teacher, writer, presenter, Bobby Siegel, and mathematician and musician, Ben Sparks. Bobby, I have to start with you. You know, I, I love the fact that you use Drake's equation to determine the number of potential partners for you. For our listeners, could you explain what the Drake equation is? And, and crucially, did it work? Drake's equation was set up in the 1960s, almost like a mathematical hypothesis to estimate the number of intelligent alien civilizations uh, in the world, or in, in the universe rather, or in our galaxy. And what Drake said is he put lots of different factors in. Like he said, first you've got to work out the, estimate the proportion of galaxies that are formed with stars. Then of those, uh, the stars that have planets. Then of those, uh, the ones that can uh, support life. Then the ones that go on to actually support life. Then the ones that go on to support intelligent life. The ones that go on to um, create technological civilizations. And then the ones that exist at the same time as us. And then you put in different numbers into these and you can either be positive, sort of positive or um, negative about it. But then you come up with a number. And then if you're very negative and you put like low factors, you come up with 0.01 number of civilizations that are broadcasting in our galaxy. And if you're really positive, you get 140,000. Like you're saying every single, you know, star has a planet, every single planet's in the habitable zone, etc. But uh, most people like come up with a value of 10 for that, um, 10 number of civilizations. And a few people have done this before. And I think the first person I saw was a academic at Warwick. He did a paper called Why I Don't Have a Girlfriend. <laughs> and he tried to adapt Drake equation to estimate his number of potential partners. So I adapted it myself, um, call it the seagull equation. So my factors were, again, the rate of formation of people in the UK is just the population. And I did this in 2017, 18, so it's about 66 and a half million at the time. Then I said the fraction of people that are female, um, which I, was 0.505 and I rounded up to 0.51. <laughs> then the fraction of women who live in Cambridge or London, so I'm doing my PhD there, I live in London. Then I said the women who are sort of in my age bracket, so I said like plus or minus, I think four or five years either side. Then I said the, the proportion that are in the right age bracket, but I have a university background. I'm not being snobbish about this. It. More like the people that I meet, the teachers, people at university have a degree, so it's more likely. It's not we say I refuse to take someone that only has a A level. No, no, that's that's not. <laughs> and then finally, I said uh, the ones that I'm attracted to. And initially, I said like ah, uh, one in ten, I feel like are my right fit. And that initially gave me a number of like 29,000. And, and Ben, as a fellow mathematician, but 29,000 women, that's a, that's a lot of people I could pick from. But, <laughs> but I, I sort of rounded it down further. So I think I said the last three factors were, I, I sort of said, I'm not, you know, Bobby Seagull's many things, but I'm not a home wrecker. So I said half of people, so if they've got a ring on it or they're with, with a partner, I'm excluding them. Then I said one in 20 match with me they like me again this is based on my sort of heuristic experience in using dating apps and then finally based on my own experience of dates only one and two end up going to second and third date and then based on that i come up with a number of 73 <laughs> so i think there are 73 people in the uk that are like potentially mrs seagull unfortunately the thing is funny enough i have discussed this on dates <laughs> this might explain why i'm still single <laughs> so um, that's how I try to use a Drake equation for estimating the number of intelligent civilizations to help me find love. It's not helping right now. See, I like I like to do my research, and I thought I thought you know we're talking about we're talking about algorithms, we're talking about dating apps, we're talking about music. I thought you know what? Let me set up two profiles in a dating app: one disclosing my sight loss, and one not disclosing my sight loss. It didn't go down too well with my wife though. Uh, she, she 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 vetoed that very quickly. Um, so uh, yeah, but it would it would have been interesting to see if it made any difference. So to see what you know how different it would have been. Just disclosing the fact that you know for me sight loss is a big thing. Does it does it affect? You know, does it bother some people? Does it bother other people a lot more? 
but yeah, it's, uh, it's 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 interesting. So you're you're still still on the dating hunt, are you, Bobby? Yes, and I have tried things like varying my profile. So I've got on different on the same app. So it's like one is Bobby and it's Bobby S, and one is Bobby, and you change things about your profile. So like it's almost like trying to game the system. Like in one, I emphasize the fact that I like sports, and another profile less sports, and then based on a couple of weeks of feedback and then I adjust the profile. So like over time you try and change the profile. So you think you get more likes and matches. So it's almost like you're trying to game the algorithm. This is it, isn't it? It's, 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 it's like, you know, you, you kind of realize, well, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be so picky now. I'm going to have to just kind of broaden my horizons and just see what, what happens. But I guess, I guess it's only as good as all the data you put in, right? So it's, you're only going to get, and that, and that's, that's the crucial part. And, and, and for me, you know, music, is, is another big thing. You know, it, it's a huge part of our life, especially since I lost my sight, because even listening to music now takes me back to, you know, 15 years ago when I was sighted. Even, even when I was dating my wife at the time, I would have a song of the day that I would send to her, which would be my kind of playlist or my, that, that particular song of how I was feeling that particular day. And it will be playing all day long, every day. Um, and, and for me, you know, it's, it, it kind of picks me up. It kind of it calms me down. It it, it just it's it's that kind of emotional af- effect it has, and mathematical equations really can I can can they can they predict music? Can they predict your mood? And I guess this is for you, Ben. It's you know what relationships does maths and music actually have? They have many many relationships, and just because they have relationships doesn't mean it's all maths. Uh, and just because things don't have relationships doesn't mean things can't be described by maths. I guess that's my first caveat, but music is definitely mathematical. And the first answer is that it's physical. It's uh, something physical is happening. Things are wobbling. Uh, that's basically all sound, right? Things, things are vibrating. And we describe vibrations using maths equations, trigonometry. In fact, sine and cosine waves are what we hear. And you can say that everything you've ever heard is a, is a combination of actually sine and cosine waves. Uh, and if you want to go deeper into that, you can look up Fourier analysis. But but that doesn't mean that you can use that to predict what will affect your emotion, at least not reliably uh, just with that information. I think there are ways to go further, but may, uh, yeah. So yes and no, I guess I'm dodging your question probably slightly. <laughs> That's right. But I, I, I guess I guess it's um it's like when you well I, we we use I use a smart speaker all the time in my house yeah. and I'm always asking it to play music, um and and it's sometimes nice just to say play the songs I like and right it's the the, the great thing with that is ninety nine percent of the time it will pick just the songs I like that sometimes it'll play Peppa Pig it'll play <laughs> it'll play nursery rhymes because my son's been in the other room saying play this and play that. But again, it's it's funny how even listening to those brings emotions, you know. Because I think of my son, I think of my daughter when I, when I listen to the music. So it's it's funny how even when it's unintended, you know, it's not the songs I want it to play, but even even that the fact that it plays it, it, it still evokes an emotion inside of me. Um, and you can be pleased or definitely have an emotional reaction to that whatever it's done. And actually, now I think I understand your question better there than that the. the uh, whatever music is made of in its fundamentals uh something trying to predict what music we want to hear right now is is a different question it's not about what is the music made of is that how similar is this to a piece of music i think you might like that's and then it becomes a question like what what bobby's chatting about which is how similar is this person to someone i might like to date it becomes almost exactly the same question and it becomes a mathematical question of how do i measure closeness uh, if I have a certain amount of data, again, this data question is going to be our fundamental callback, I think, here. If you have enough data, you can start answering questions about how close one piece of data is to another piece of data. And that's a mathematical question that might correlate to, are you going to like this music or person? I think they're very similar questions. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because I, you know, I, would, I would love to learn to play an instrument. I have no patience whatsoever to sit down and learn to read music whatsoever. You put, you put, you put a physics book in front of me or something medical journal and I can sit there all day looking at that. But it's, it's, it's so funny. You, I kind of, I guess for me, music and, and, and science is, is so visual. It's, it's such a visual thing. And, and, and the question really is um, how do, how do machines learn to, to write music? Can they really know the difference, you know, between, something that's been composed by a human and something that's that's composed by by a machine because it uses the data i guess does you know is, is there a way of finding out or does it does it 
predict it or does it just just use that data and just put something out there's a lot of questions in there and i guess there's a to, to hone home in on a couple of important things is uh how do, how does anything learn to do anything so how do humans learn to do anything and you alluded a little bit to that already it takes practice and it takes time to build familiarity and as a parallel that's true of machines however you, you're going to describe them learning stuff and whether it's the same process it takes time and in their case data and if you're going to start talking about machine learning which is kind of what we're referencing here uh you have to train machine learning well there's always a period of training which is a little bit like humans practicing stuff but it is possible to get a machine to compose music um and to cut a long story short uh People have done it, and people have also run tests to see to, to do like uh, what they might call a blind trial, which is not meant to be ironic in this circumstance. But where you where you play something to an audience who don't know which is which and ask them to vote which they think is composed by a human, uh, which is composed by a computer. And there's a very good example of that. Hannah Fry did it on the Christmas lectures a couple of years ago, uh, and they played some live music, and one of which was composed by a computer uh, based on an algorithm. Although I hasten to add that the algorithm was written by a human. I'm sorry, we can't get quite away from that the humans at some point in the story and one was actually composed by a human i think it was bach at the time in that example so it can be done and i'll happily say more about how it might be done but it can be done uh, whether it is true music or not is a different question perhaps which maybe i'm not qualified to answer i don't know what bobby thinks about this yeah actually when on that i've um, read a book so during lockdown one I was trying to educate myself about algorithms and I read um, Hello World by, again, the amazing Dr. Hannah Fry and also The Creativity Code by Dr. Marx de Satoy. And the subtitle of that book is How AI, so it's Artificial Intelligence, is Learning to Write, Paint and Think. Um, and in his book, he talks about, again, art. He has like re um, real Rembrandts and AI trying to recreate Rembrandts and even things like jazz music, a real version of jazz, and then an AI created jazz. And... I think he was saying that when we try and look at the piece of Rembrandt or we try and listen to a piece of music, we're sort of looking at it from a human perspective. And what, he had a really great quote in his book from the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he uh, Wittgenstein had a book in the 50s called Philosophical Investigations. And he said, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. So I think when we look at sort of AI, artificially generated music or art, I think if we're trying to say, oh, is that computer creative? Is that algorithm really thinking like us? But of course, it, it is thinking, but not in the way that we think, not in the way that we're creative. Like, again, when Ben writes his music, and Ben, you need to be people there, listen, go and check Ben's music. Ben's got some amazing music by itself and maths music as well, haven't you? You've got some cool bits out there on the internet. Now I'm worried <laughs> about what music you've actually listened to, maybe anyway. <laughs> But like when so when you're when when you're Ben being creative, you you might have like a a great cup of coffee or you you are you know you see the sunshine and that makes you think of some ideas. Whereas for the algorithm, it depends on the program and what they put in it. So you have got like a basic algorithm yeah. that just follows the set of instructions. But then you've got the more deep learning ones where you create an algorithm and then it learns for itself. And that's the most I'm not I don't know if scary is the right word, but that's where it's like wow these computers really can create their own way of thinking to create music or art? I guess as, as a visually impaired person, that I haven't always been visually impaired. You know, I had, I had perfect sight so, uh, 13 years ago. So when someone describes something to me, I can visualize it. I, I can I can walk down the road, even on a dark, cold day, and, and picture it being bright and sunny. Uh, you know, the leaves have got, the trees have got leaves on, the flowers are out, um, because you can adapt. Um, and, I can, and I guess... I guess the question is, you know, do you visualize maths or music in order to understand it better? Is visualizing parts of it kind of, is it, does it help you understand it better? I think most mathematicians would say yes, but uh, I, I'm interested to throw to Bobby on this thought as well. But I've just, I saw a Twitter discussion recently between a bunch of maths educators about whether when someone says, Im imagine this in your head, um, and a lot of people responding, well, I, I just can't do that. I cannot hold a picture in my mind. Um, and I don't, I, I forget the technical word. Is it, it's not a, a, fantas an, a fantasia. I'm guessing slightly. I haven't looked up the technical word for this, but there, there seems to be whether or not you see well with your eyes. Uh, some people have different experiences of whether they can mentally visualize things. Uh, it seems to be completely not related to your actual visual um, situation. But 
I definitely like to visualize stuff and it helps me understand mathematics. But when I do, I usually find myself itching to try and draw a picture and get a physical representation um, and actually end up resorting to software to, to sort of make something move and get a visual representation. So yes and no, I, I definitely visualize stuff in my head, uh, but I also cry out for a physical representation, which could even be tactile rather than visual, but something outside my head. Bobby, do you, do you feel similar? I think it's interestingly, it's visualizing things is something that I've always found not coming second nature to me. So as a child, when I first got into maths, the thing that I loved about maths was the number work, prime numbers, all those sort of things. And anything that was visual, like the geometry, I always struck again, it's not that, was it, was it aphantasia? That was that inability yeah. to visualize things. It's not that, I think I just have a, I, mean, I always believe that I don't think people have like an innate mind for things, but I have a uninnate mind for visual things. Even like okay, when I'm driving or walking around, I get lost quite quickly. I can tell you all the facts about that street and the city I'm in, but you give me a map or a GPS and I still manage to get myself lost. So it's, it's something that I've been trying to work on, improving my visual way of um, organizing things. So I don't know, like Ben, so like... Again, I'm not I'm not a musician, but when I was younger, I used to play the piano and the Indian flute. And Indian flute's pretty much similar to the Western flute, but it's all all the um, apertures are there's no valve. You sort of move your finger left, and you you can move your finger like thirty percent, forty percent, fifty percent of the way across an aperture. But when I nice. was learning the instruments, I tried to learn it like by numbers, like oh three finger seven, finger two, finger three, and I and I, and I almost detach myself from the emotional side which is why i think i struggle because with music you're meant to feel it again now when i listen to music now if i'm you know at west ham my club of one i'll put some exciting like happy music which actually this year has been happening a lot and i feel the emotion of it but when i was learning to play an instrument i tried to make it too analytical like okay mm. step one step two step three finger four finger seven and because of that i really struggled so maybe it's like maybe i needed that visual component as well the emotional um to have become a competent musician. I wonder if there's uh, some sort of fundamental things that we all visualize, but we visualize them differently uh, and to maybe a greater or lesser extent. So for example, if if you think of the numbers from one to 10, do, do we have images in our mind when we conjure up those numbers? If we're adding two plus seven, for example, are we seeing any sort of picture that goes with that mathematical calculation? Because that then has ramifications for all of the rest of the thinking you do about analytical or non-analytical subjects is what images come to mind almost unconsciously. And I'm, maybe we could share if there are images because we've got a sample of three here uh, with different experiences and different visual perceptions. Uh, I, I wonder, I mean, I don't want to spoil the game, but do, do you, Hamid, do you see anything when you think of the numbers from one to 10 in your mind? Do you know what I do? I do. I, I do. It's it, in a way, it, it would, if you asked me this five years ago, I would probably just say, I would probably just see the number straight in front of me because I know what it looks like. I know what a number one to number The number one to like. uh, so written if in an Arabic me, numeral, rather. Just written, yes, written in an Arabic numeral. Yeah, just really plain and really simple. But if you ask me now, I see it as Braille ah. because obviously, so for, for me, I, you know, I don't, I can't read written, written text. Um, so for me, Braille is, is, is my way of, you know, reading. And at the moment I'm, I'm, I'm teaching my son to read. I'm teaching him to count numbers and do his maths, but we have, we have letters, we have like letter blocks and they've all got Braille underneath them. So they, you can, he can physically, he can visually see the letters or the numbers, but underneath the, the numbers and the, and the letters are Braille. Um, so that way I know what they are. And I can see the Braille numbers because this is it's such a, again, it's, it's an emotion. But when I see things that I kind of want to put it together, things that make me happy. So sitting down with my son, you know, have Braille bricks out or or scrabble pieces out with braille on them that's what i see um and i can i can and it's funny even even talking about that when we're talking about navigating when bobby's talking about navigating do you remember the old episode of friends where joey and china stand inside of a map in in london um so that's me i am that google little person in google because the last time i saw google it was this little orange kind of character and i'm that character inside of a map and so when I'm visualizing places, even even walking around places I'm, I'm familiar with, I'm that little person walking along that, that little Google map. So it, it's funny how how you do visualize things. How about yourself, Ben? How, how, how does it work for you? I suspect that the way we visualize things, which might be uh, unconscious, affects whether we how we understand them. So 
but I don't know if I visualize numbers correctly or even if there is a, a correct way. Um, I think if I if I think about the numbers between one to ten, say, I do see not very well organized and not deliberately, I see a number line. I am aware that if I'm thinking about the number five, I think I'm seeing the numeral five, but I'm also aware of four, three, two, one, zero below it, sort of vaguely and slightly mistily, and the fact that I'm halfway to ten is part of my picture. And I know for a fact that that helps me when I'm trying to do mental arithmetic calculations to sort of, if I have that visualization, I can jump to another bit of the line. Now, I'm not particularly good at mental arithmetic, so maybe it's not the best way to visualize these things, but I do have some sort of image other than just the the symbol or the code, which is, I could just see the number five or I could see the, the number five in braille or in a different symbol like system. I'm seeing some sort of spatial relationship, definitely, even if it's not well-defined. Actually, on on that, uh, Ben, when I think about numbers, obviously the first thing is I, I, I visualize the, the Roman Arabic numeral. But then secondly, again, maybe this is why I, I've got on with maths more than music as a child, is I actually do have like an emotional attachment to a number. Um, and it could be related to my family. Like often, like for example, the number 10, my dad's one of 10 siblings. <laughs> He's the eldest of 10. So I think of I think of my dad's family when I think of that. Or when I think of the number seven, I think it's my favorite prime number under 10 um or the number four is the, it, i'm one of four boys in my family so obviously that obviously when the first few weren't born uh, or the younger ones weren't born it that obviously didn't exist that that uh, connection but i think for me i there's the visual impact of the number itself and then what the number might mean to me in terms of connections in my life i don't know whether it's something that i've developed as an adult or whether it's sort of something that was bubbling along in my teenage childhood years that's pretty interesting because then if you looked at numbers that are way beyond what we normally deal with, like numbers above 10 million, mm. say, which I think most of us then don't have lots of emotional resonance to because we just don't really ever use them very often, at least not often enough to pick up emotional resonance. And then are we are we poorer because of it? Because we can't sort of attach meaning to those. Whereas if, if a spatial relationship exists, I'm not claiming that I've got this right because I'm not sure what I visualize <laughs> with those big numbers. But uh, if it was a generalizable visualization, then you start to be able to visualize things even if they're not familiar that i think is going back to amit's original question visualizing helps all of us whether we do it consciously or unconsciously uh, but maybe training our minds to think of different visualizations can be one way of improving the way we understand or think about difficult topics i'm gonna go back to the whole dating app now because i think that's gonna that's gonna be a bit more fun <laughs> yeah, <do it. laughs> And, and it's really, how does it affect an algorithm or the results if you choose not to disclose something about yourself, which everybody probably does, uh, you know, when joining an, uh, a dating app? Because it's quite relevant that uh, there was a story recently about a blind woman who joined a dating app, and she was actually contacted by the by the app themselves, and they said that um, she probably should come off the app because everybody on the app doesn't, nobody actually wants to date a disabled person. And she actually disclosed that I, th I think she was a, she's a wheelchair user. Um, so it's, it's funny how, you know, one piece of information can dis you know, can, can kind of push you right to the end or right to the, right to the back of the queue. Because thinking about it about six years ago, when I was actually matched to my guide dog, um, I didn't realize just how much data was involved um, because throughout the throughout the training and throughout the the assessment, I guess the guide dog instructors were collecting all the information. You know, my my age, my sex, my height, uh, where I lived, how fast I walked, where I worked, um, information about my surroundings, what's nearby, how much will the dog have to go into the city? Will it be able to use an escalator? Um, and all of this is kind of taken on board. And it's put into a database. And then when every dog is graduated, they look back at the database and say, right, this dog is, has this tendency and is, is, is capable of doing this. So it's going to match to this person. But when I, when I got the call, I was, I was to actually told that, oh, Amit, you're on the list because we definitely think a guide dog would, will enhance your life. But at the moment, we're probably looking at two to maybe three years to find that perfect match because we don't have anything in the system that, that we think will, will be suitable for you. Um, and would you believe six weeks later, I get a phone call saying, we think we found you a match, but she may not like you, is what I got told. Um, because Kika happened to be the most stubborn dog <laughs> through guide dogs. Um, she had issues where she was she wasn't really attached to anybody even even with the uh, instructors it it took them it took them weeks to get kika into a dog harness 
um, for a training. But for whatever reason, that if, if, if all of this information was put on a system, they would have taken her off as, as, as a guide dog. They would have retired her before she would even made it as a guide dog. But it was the human instinct where someone said, actually, she has potential. We just have to just keep, you know, pushing, pushing, pushing and finding that right partner. And when they actually they brought Kika around for the first time, she for, for about half an hour, she just completely ignored me and she fell asleep. Um, eventually she stood up and actually came over and, and, and kind of said hi to me and the instructors actually did say look she's not making for the door this is the best we're going to get and and Kika now has you know she's been with me for for five and a five and a bit years now and she travels the world with me and I trust my life with her but if it was down to just the data Kika wouldn't be in my life and I wouldn't have you know the, uh, the I, I guess I wouldn't have the the confidence, the motivation, the, the independence I have now to travel the world as me and a guide dog. Um, but people say, you know, it isn't, isn't, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to kind of predict what, what could happen, but I think you need some human intervention. Um, but it's, it's very much, you know, the question is if you don't put in the right data, if you, if you, if you decide to disclose something, are you going to get, a true representation of, of an algorithm or is it just going to kind of go if the wrong asking, way? Is human intervention important? Uh, I think I, I'm going to guess that we all Im- instinctively say, yes, of course it is. Uh, and saying otherwise would need some pretty heavy justification. Uh, we, we, I'm going to, I'm going to say before I let Bobby give his gut reaction to this is that, but if you ask the algorithm designer, the, the person who's got their hands on writing the, the code that analyzes the data that we've just been talking about, say it's matching a guide dog or a dating app. If you ask the algorithm designer, they will be full of, well, it's limited up to this because I know how I've written the code and it's only going to work up to this amount of, because I know, I know what I've written. But if you hand the algorithm to someone else who hasn't written the code, what happens is they tend to have more sort of implicit and possibly unfounded faith in the black box is, oh, it's meant to do it for me. And it's it's that problem that we're talking about uh, is that the person who writes the code knows its limitations, but everyone else doesn't because you haven't had your hands getting dirty in, into how rough and ready it is. How do you feel about that, Bobby? Oh yeah, so I think is yeah, we're in a world where people we often rely on algorithms, and we you know people obviously are it's a mathematician they've created. I'll put my trust in it. And again, it often depends on what the nature of the algorithm is. Like even in dating apps. You've got the simpler ones like Tinder and the more complex ones like OK Cupid. And simpler ones like Tinder essentially work a bit like um, the ELO, the rating for chess. And that's like if you win matches, you move up the ranking. And if you lose matches, you move down the ranking. And the most basic apps like Tinder, which are, I'm not a big fan of, is just literally, do you like the face of someone or not? And either swipe. Yes, right, it's very visual. It's isn't very that? superficial. And the more swipes you get right, or yeah, I assume right, right on the app, the higher you move up this algorithm, as it were. It gives you a higher internal rating. Um, and that's a really simplistic algorithm. And then the more complex ones, like OkCupid okay, and eHarmony, uh, they use like a most compatible option, like something's called the um, Gale Shapley algorithm. And actually, that was created by two economists uh, in the 1960s, where they were trying to prove that any pool of people could be sh- uh, sort of sifted into stable marriages. Although for that, the, again, the assumption is you've got an equal number of um, people on either side who want to date. So 10 people here who want to date a male, 10 people want to date a female, and then the algorithm will match people up. So uh, again, I think with algorithms, there are so many, again, it's people, we use it as a, a sort of buzzword to to capture so many different types of things. There are really simple algorithms. Again, it could be if I'm waking up in the morning, my algorithm is um, check to see if it's bright. If it's bright, wake up. If it's not bright, stay in bed a bit longer because I've clearly gotten up too early. So you you have simple algorithms that maybe help work out our daily lives. And the more complex ones like the Gail Shapley or even, I don't know, more complex things that help to decide I don't know, I'm trying to think, was, I'm trying to think ben, of a more complex well, algorithm. Maybe we should try a really simple example of how an algorithm like maybe the eHarmony, OK, Cupid ones you're talking about, how they measure the mm. closeness of match, because it isn't a, a fundamentally complicated idea. So uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, si- a simple example. Let's rate people. Uh, we'll go with a dating example, right? Let's rate people on whether they like the Pet Shop Boys. I have no idea why that just came to mind. <laughs> on a scale of one <laughs> to ten. Uh, uh, and, let's, uh, and let's do another rating completely separate on whether they're like dogs on a scale from one to ten. And then you're, the job of the algorithm is to figure out, given two people uh, and their answers to that question, 
how close are they? That's one way of saying like, are they are they far apart or close? Now you can you can say, well, let's just find the differences in the numbers. That's one thing. But you could also imagine, and here's our visualization coming back to haunt us. Imagine a a, a two dimensional surface, a flat surface with a, a coordinate grid on it, and you can plot everyone's profile on that coordinate grid. So the x coordinate could be how much they like the pet shop boys, and the y coordinates their dog liking rating. And and then and then all you need to do is measure how far apart part those two points are in literal distance in our visualized thing so actually it beca- the mathematician's answer it comes down to a pythagoras calculation because it's like two sides of a right angle triangle to get the distance between two points now that's super simple but a low a small distance means oh these are quite closely matched and that's an, something an algorithm could do it just takes all the numbers that people have put to answers to a survey questions like that and calculate the pythagorean to make it sound technical the pythagorean distance between them and close distances means it's quite a good match. And what's nice mathematically is that you don't just you can you can't just do that in two dimensions. You could do it in three dimensions or four dimensions or twenty six dimensions. And the more questions you ask, the more data you have, the more confidence you have in your answer to how closely matched these people are. Now that all all that says is are their answers similar? And you've got an algorithmic way of measuring how similar their answers are. Great. It doesn't tell you whether that means they're going to like each other. It just doesn't tell you that. <laughs> it just tells you how close they are and the data. And I suspect something similar is happening even with the guide dog matching thing. You have some answers to some sort of somewhat arbitrary questions and you can measure how closely aligned they are with what you want them to be for a certain purpose. But it doesn't answer the question of will it work, which is why dating apps are not 100% successful, or at least partly why. So when we humans use data and algorithms to teach machines to do something, how much of it is about the machines and how much is it really about the humans? I mean, what, what you've just said is the big realisation, isn't it? That it, it's a human behind it. The, the caveat, uh, and I think Bobby was about, I feel like Bobby was about to say this as well, is that humans also make mistakes. Like, it's not just the machines messing this up. It's usually the, the human messing it up or forgetting to put into their design a caveat in the algorithm. So, you know, maybe you say, right, they forget to mark one piece of medical information as confidential and it shouldn't be shared beyond the, like there's a human mistake, but the machine makes it matter. I and mean, I, I could talk about this all day, but the idea you're saying is that the machine is a tool and it happens to be a spectacularly powerful tool. Pattern recognition turns out to be done much, much, much better by a computer than us, which is why it can see more patterns much more quickly than us. And the consequences of that are sometimes, oh, we didn't think it would notice that because humans don't notice that from that amount of data, but the machine does. It's not because it's being cleverer, it's because it's doing the heavy lifting more efficiently. And the humans have to be aware of the consequences or or have to pay the price. And to use our example, that, that raw data is equivalent to our questions about pet shop boys and liking dogs. It's just a lot of it in on different scale. And then you just got to do something with that data. And one of the things you could do is measure closeness of match and see whose eyes match or measure how close their eye data matches to someone who you know has the disease. And suddenly you've got a way of predicting whether they will have the disease. And then so you see the same algorithm for dating is being used possibly this is a simplification, but to, to identify disease. This is a topic that's really kind of, it hits home to me. Obviously, you know, when you, you, when you go out, when you talk to people, you pick up so much on visual clues. Even, even you know, my whole year has been working on, on Zoom calls and everything else. And obviously, I, I never know whether to turn my microphone, my, my uh, camera on or leave it off or you know people are very very unsure whether you know the whole thing is when you've got when you've got 20 people on a zoom call and people are putting their hands up to ask questions it doesn't work for me i can't it you know so it's it's great that people slowly start adapting and changing um but but the, the funniest thing is when i when i meet someone for the first time within five seconds i will judge that person by the way they talk to me not just what they say but how they say it and that's the crucial part you know i, I can pick up that sarkiness in their voice or that just that boredness or what if they don't want to be there and i'll turn around to my wife and i'll say oh you know i hate this person my wife no no that's how they talk all the time i it. you know that's that's just them and it you know it's 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 that whole thing where visual for me the whole visual thing is still very, very important because it's every day. You know, I live in a world that's visual. Everything is 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 focused on on visual. You know, and I I don't want to be on that side where I completely forget about all of that. I still I still appreciate anything. You know, I I will go when we when we go out car hunting. I'm the one with my hands over the car, feeling every bump and just seeing how it feels and and putting it back into my head and put and 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 trying to picture something that I remember what it looks like. You know, and and things like 
so even you know i i say this to everybody i, I say that my wife will never age she will look exactly the same she did when i when the day i lost my sight she will never ever you know that's who, when i picture my wife that's who who i see i will never see my kids i don't know what they look like but you know to me my son now says, Daddy, my nose is growing just a little bit more. Daddy, my, my you know, I, I, I think I think my ears are like my uncle's ears now. You know, they're getting big. I'm like, yeah, yeah you've got your uncle's ears. You know, that kind of, it's, it's, and it, we've never taught him all of this. He he watches me do things. He, you know, my daughter, she's 19 months old. She's watching me do things. And she realizes Daddy does it differently to how mommy does it. But they're learning. And, and you know, it all make, to them, they don't have a blind dad. They just have a dad. And I love that. I love that my family don't think about me as a blind person and, and to be able to talk about visuals and, you know, all of these things that play a big part in my life. I love that. And I was really, when I, when I was told that Ben and Bobby were coming on this, you know, I was super excited because music and maths and, you know, I'm, I'm proper geeky. I, 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 you know, I was at Cambridge and I, and I know the whole, whole thing about the geekiness, but I'm, I kind of want to be, not just geeky. I kind of, I kind of want to bring geekiness into everyday life, and so this is a conversation I've really enjoyed. So thank you so much. I really like the fact that what you're talking about in this podcast, in your circumstance, is is making people realise that algorithms are a tool, and they are a tool that can be fantastically useful, especially if you need to compensate for loss of a sense, for example. But but they also have these dangers. It's just that algorithms are a tool, and the, tools have consequences both positive and negative in the same way as a hammer is a really really brilliant invention for getting nails into a wall but it doesn't mean you can't hit your thumb with them still right so the same thing applies to algorithms and you are demonstrating really nicely that they can be really useful ways and a lot of people haven't noticed to to help give more information when it's not available well that's it for today don't forget to follow us on twitter our handle is at insight ihub i would love to hear your feedback Today's episode was presented by myself, Amit Patel, with special guests Bobby Siegel and Ben Sparks. 